Thank you for attending our 2022 National Day of Action, a training for our advocates. I'd like to introduce Phil Goglis. He is the managing partner at HMC and our foundation's representative in Washington, D.C. Phil, would you share a little bit more about our partnership? Absolutely, Karen. Thank you for having me today and thank you all for uh, participating with us. Uh, as Karen mentioned, my name is Phil Goglis. I work here in Washington, D.C. with the Health and Medicine Council. HMC has worked with the National Scleroderma Foundation for many years, and we are your eyes and ears here in Washington, D.C. to report back on relevant items that happen within Congress and across federal agencies. We work in very close um, partnership with the leadership of the National Scleroderma Foundation to map out key priorities and key legislative items that we work on uh, advancing in Congress, and we help to educate members of Congress and federal agencies about the importance of scleroderma and about advancing key priorities that benefit our community. Thank you, Phil. Uh, my name is Karen Anatrello. I'm the manager of Adv advocacy and support at the foundation. Our mission is to advance medical research, promote disease awareness, and provide support and education to people with scleroderma, their families, and support networks. Sharing your personal story with scleroderma leaves a lasting impact. Every lawmaker is interested in what matters to the people they represent. When we include constituents and in our communications with elected officials, it results <clears throat> excuse me, it results in direct connections to their primary agendas. Your stories have real value to offices. What they need to track constituent sentiment closely. Today's agenda, how our government works, the power of our advocates, contacting your legislators, our current legislative goals, and your questions. Phil, would you mind taking us through an over overview of how our government functions? Absolutely. Uh, so a quick review of the US federal government. Uh, there are three branches of government. You have the executive branch, which is the presidential administration. They enforce laws. You have the judicial branch, which are the courts and they interpret laws, and then you have the legislative branch, which is Congress, and they're the ones who create and enact laws and policies. The reason why we focus our advocacy efforts mainly on Congress is because of the authority they have. They have the power of the purse, which means they determine how much each federal agency receives in annual funding. They are the source that creates specific policies that are implemented, and they have oversight over key federal agencies in terms of ensuring that uh, they are executing and advancing priorities that Congress has uh, requested them to. Thank you. So a little bit about Congress. You have the Senate, which uh, each senator is elected to a six year term. There are two senators from each state, so it doesn't matter if you live in a low population state like Delaware or a high population state like California, uh, each you know, citizen of Delaware and California have the same number of senators. Those are two. So there's a total of 100 senators uh, in the US Senate. The House of Representatives is a little different. You have members that are all elected to two year terms. You have one representative per district and there are 435 representatives in the House. The one difference is with the House and the Senate is population matters. So for high population states like California, there are over 50 members of the House of Representatives, while lower population states like Delaware only have one representative for the entire state. Every 10 years, Congress, through the census, reconfigures their number of members from each state, depending on the census and changes in population. So currently, we're at a point where for the next Congress starting in January, there have been some shifts and all that has depended on population. For example, uh, the state of Montana currently only has one member of the House of Representatives, but because of an increase in population, they're scheduled to get a second seat in the House starting next year. And then a state like New York lost population, so they're losing two congressional seats starting in the next year. So the Senate is fixed to 100 members, two from every state, none of that changes. On the House side, the number of House members from each state will change depending on population. Thank you. And if, what Congress does in terms of passing bills, in order to become a law, a bill must pass the House and the Senate and, to, and has to be signed by the President. 
this is a universal process that applies to any law that uh, or any bill that is introduced for it to become established law. There are a number of must pass items such as the annual appropriations process and that process determines how much each federal agency receives in funding. Each year Congress has to pass funding bills to keep the government up and running to allocate funding resources for each federal agency. And when members of Congress are working through creating and voting and considering these bills, they consider constituent feedback about specific priorities that they should include. And that's critical to the work that we're doing and some of the key issues that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Absolutely. So how Congress acts, there are there is a committee structure in the House and the Senate. They're the ones who are tasked with vetting uh, bills as they come through before they make it to the full floor for consideration. So for our purposes, we focus on four main committees on the Senate side. Uh, sorry, three main committees on the Senate side and three main committees on the House side. On the Senate side, you have the Appropriations Committee. They are the senators who decide how much funding is allocated for federal agencies, as well as specific recommendations. You have the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, which is appropriately the HELP Committee. They are the ones with specific oversight of key federal agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration. They are the ones who also um, have jurisdiction over health care policy. So we work very closely with the HELP Committee when they have specific pieces of health legislation that they are considering. You also have the Finance Committee, which oversees tax issues, they, but they also have oversight over Medicare and Medicaid through CMS. So the HELP and Finance Committee work very closely together in terms of uh, advancing health care policies as well as having oversight over federal key federal agencies. On the House side, you also have the Appropriations Committee. They're the counterpart to the Senate Appropriations Committee. They as well decide how much money is allocated for federal agencies, as well as including specific recommendations. On the House side, you have the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the equivalent to the HELP Committee. The Energy and Commerce Committee on the House side is tasked with oversight of specific health federal agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they also oversee health care policy. You also have the Ways and Means Committee, which is the counterpart to the Senate Finance Committee, and the Ways and Means on the House side, they have oversight over tax issues, Medicare, Medicaid through CMS, uh, and they also work very closely with the Energy and Commerce Committee on advancing key health care legislation. Thank you, Phil. So let's talk a little bit about power of our advocates. <clears throat> advocates in our community communicate with impact. They share their stories that are chosen to show change that needs to happen. They share information that is new to their audiences and they deliver information strategically with integrity. Advocates listen. They know, they know that others may have differing views or priorities and they listen with respect. They understand that advocacy is not a single transaction. It's a process. As an individual, you have one voice and you're an advocate in a coordinated nationwide effort and you're an influencer and we thank you for sharing your story. On June 29th, our goal is to increase the sound of one simple request to help us find a cure for scleroderma. By combining lots of individual individual voices into one united voice, we turn up the volume together as a scleroderma community. Phil, I'm going to uh, hand it back to you about contacting our legislators. Thanks, Karen. Um, to contact your legislators, we have some helpful tips for everybody. Um, first is to prepare for the day of action on June 29th uh, and advocacy beyond by using the foundation materials. Uh, we're going to ask you to call your elected officials local office ask to speak with a staffer who handles health care policy and ask for the name and email address of the DC based health staffer as well. We're going to ask you to follow up via email with the staffer that you spoke with and continue to stay in touch throughout the year. Our advocacy efforts are 365 days 
And we've been successful with our advocacy efforts over the years because of the relationships that our advocates have created with their elected officials and the continued conversations they've had about critical updates and other ways that members can uh, continue to support and advance priorities for our community. To find your senators, we're going to ask that you go to www.senate.gov. You're going to use the find your senators section function search function, excuse me, uh, on the pull down menu at the top of your screen. You will see a link to your senators websites. Again, you have two senators from your state. We're going to ask that you go onto their website, explore what their website has to offer. You're going to look for their contact information. Um, and where they have information specifically about where their offices are located, uh, the addresses, the phone numbers, and then we're going to ask you again to call that office that's closest to you. If you live in a state like New York, you'll see that your senators have different offices throughout the state. So if, if you live on Long Island, you know, you would call the local Melville office as opposed to the Buffalo office. But you live if you live up in Buffalo, you would make contact with that Buffalo office, not the Long Island office. We also ask you to follow your senators on social media. Again, we want to keep our focus on specific scleroderma priorities, but it's important for you as well to see where your senators are active in your state, uh, where you might have an opportunity to connect with them, to further educate them or their staff about the importance of scleroderma and our priorities. Thank you, Phil. And finding your representative. To find your representative, it's very similar. Um, what we ask you to do is to go to house.gov. You're going to use the find your representative search function. What's different here is you're going to be required to put in your full address to make sure that you are locating who your actual representative is. As we mentioned earlier, your senators cover your entire state, but your house uh, a representative member covers a specific district. So you may be in a zip code where it is split between two congressional districts where on one side of town it's represented by one member, but on the other side of town it's somebody else, despite the fact that you live in the same zip code. So we're going to ask you to put your whole address in there with your zip code. Again, it'll take you to a results page uh, with your representative. Go to their website, look at their contact information, find that office that's closest to you. Again, in states like Delaware or the Dakotas, where there's only one member of the House uh, for that entire state, they will have different office locations. But if you live in, you know, New York, for instance, or or another state, or if you live in the city of Chicago, you know, your member of Congress may only have one local office because of the size of the district. Uh, we're again going to ask you to call that local office to make that connection. And then similar to what we're doing with the senators, ask you to follow them on social media uh, to see what opportunities there are to connect with them, if there are any town halls or different events that they're holding. And it also gives you an opportunity to keep an eye on what your elected official is doing here in Washington. Thank you. So of course we're asking you to keep your call simple. Uh, phone calls are different from meetings because you have a very short window of time to identify yourself, tell what your issue is, and ask what it is that you're asking for. The person uh, taking your call or checking the voicemail will be most interested in knowing that you're an actual constituent of the state or district they represent and what they request uh, and what you're requesting uh, of the elected official. And here's your script that you can follow. So how do I prepare? Um, every meeting with Congress requires a plan. Before you arrive, you should know what the plan, what you're asking, and who will do the talking and in what order. Um, and as Phil can attest to, uh, we do our best to prepare um, our constituents uh, for meetings before uh, we have a, you know, an outline script um, and we try to have a meeting before to answer any questions and um, hopefully uh, help with any any nerves. Karen, if I could just uh, add to that, you know, Please. we are here to be a great resource to all of you. You are the first and foremost expert in your story and what your experience has been with scleroderma. We are going to review some of the key issues, but I want to just uh, highlight it's not important for you to memorize every single dollar amount that we're advocating for every specific um, part of what we're advocating for. It's important to know 
but the most important thing when you're engaging with your elected officials is to share what how has scleroderma changed your life what has your experience been with scleroderma that's what you're an expert in the foundation uh in conjunction with myself you know we work on the policy aspects we work on the specifics that's why it's critically important for uh, you to follow up with us and let us know who you spoke with, how everything went to help you prepare. We encourage everybody to write their story down to really, you know, take a moment to think, what do you want your elected official to know about scleroderma? What difference has it made in your life if you're a patient or if you're a caregiver or a loved one? What have you seen uh, scleroderma do in your life? And why is it important that they, the elected officials, support our key priorities? Uh, so we ask you to practice, you know, to say it out loud. It'll help you manage your nerves. Uh, we also have seen that it's helpful for folks to write it down so that way they have all of their key points laid out for them to be able to ensure that they touch upon it. Um, and in advance of making these calls, we ask you to make any notes that you might have or questions for the staffer because you may have that opportunity to engage in that conversation with them. Uh, again, I do want to stress, you know, if anybody has you know specific questions or would like to go through a little more in depth of any of this uh, peel, uh please excuse me feel free to reach out to us uh, but we have created uh scripts for you that karen has showed to make it as easy as possible so the only thing you have to insert is that personal story thanks phil great tips so by sharing your story you provide context for the ask and let the elected official or staffer know that how important the ask is for you, your family, those you care for, and those who care for you. And as Phil mentioned, remember, you don't have to memorize any policy or facts. And obviously we're, we're here to answer any questions. First so, and foremost, oh sure, go ahead, Phil. <laughs> sorry, Karen. Um, so I was just gonna say, uh, you know, this is something we've mentioned that we just mentioned. Uh, some key things we just ask you all to do at, at the end is just let us know how the conversation went. Who did you reach out to? Who did you speak with? Did they have any questions? Uh, did you email somebody and get a reply? Or did you call an office and nobody was there? All of these things are critically important to share with us. Uh, as the foundation's you know, on the ground representative here in Washington, I work very closely with all 435 House members and all 100 Senate offices um, to follow up and, and make those connections and really drive home the importance of their the members supporting our priorities. Um, so, you know, please make sure that you do follow up with us. Let us know everything that that happened so that way we can follow up on that end. Uh, I also just for the from the previous slide wanted to to just reiterate if you have any questions about what you should or should not include in your story, uh, please feel free to send us an email and, and ask those questions. We want everybody to feel as comfortable as they can uh, with engaging with Congress. I know if you're a first time advocate, you might have uh, a, be a little bit nervous about engaging, but you'll see that after your first, you know, advocacy experience that some of it becomes second nature and you'll feel a lot more comfortable. So we just want to continue to be that resource and help you walk through the process uh, to again, make you feel as comfortable as possible. Thank you, Phil. Uh, let's touch on uh, our current legislative goals. So uh, we are in the second session of the 117th Congress. There continues to currently be the discussion on the budget and appropriations activity. Uh, the House just this week, uh, the week of June 21st, is working on marking up key bills and will be marking up some bills as well next week. There also continues to be discussion on healthcare policy, which includes medical research that we're going to be talking about as well. So one of our key asks is for NIH funding. Uh, and I mentioned previously that uh, some of the key congressional committees have oversight of the National Institutes of Health. For those of you who are not familiar with NIH, the NIH is the National Institutes of Health. It is the world's foremost organization supporting biomedical research. We work very closely with the National Institutes of Health 
and specifically the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, which is appropriately used the acronym of NIAMS. Again, you don't have to memorize any of these acronyms or any of these you know, specific federal agencies. Uh, all of this is included in the talking points and in the sample scripts that we provided. Um, but what the NIH does is support biomedical research. And the more funding that NIH has overall, the more money they're able to put into supporting specific scleroderma research. What our ask for Congress to do is, is to provide the National Institutes of Health with at least $49 billion in funding for fiscal year 2023. Uh, earlier this year, the foundation had a very productive meeting with the leadership of NIAMS about scleroderma research and the need to advance the activity at the Institute and across the National Institutes of Health as a whole. The only way we're able to do that is if NIH and NIAMS receives more funding. Uh, so we are asking for Congress to support NIH uh, increased funding. We also know that there is broad support for the NIH funding across political lines and across the House and the Senate. So you'll most likely hear when you connect with your legislators that their boss supports NIH funding and that they will continue to push for it. But we just like to continue to flag for offices that for the scleroderma community, NIH funding is critically important. Absolutely. Um, Philip, can you walk us through uh, our current PRMRP? Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know, there is uh, medical research that's done at the Department of Defense. I know that it, it can get a little confusing that uh, DOD does health research, but there is a peer reviewed medical research program that is housed through the Department of Defense. And what this program was created for was to research health conditions that uh, had a greater impact or a greater prevalence among active military servicemen and service women. Each year in the Senate, the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, as part of their work, creates a list of eligible conditions that are deemed uh, eligible for study, meaning if you're on this list of eligible conditions, your research community is able to apply for grants to receive funding for research into that specific condition. To be included on this list, a senator has to officially make that request and work with their colleagues to include that. The way to get that done is to hear from their constituents. Uh, senators, because they represent large constituencies, have a lot of competing appropriation priorities. What we do is ensure that constituents are making their requests to their senators to ask them to work with their colleagues to ensure that scleroderma is included as a condition eligible for study through the PRMRP. Thank you. And uh, to go into a little more detail, uh, again, why the Department of Defense, the DOD has this program that's specifically created for conditions that, again, uh, have a greater impact among servicemen and service women. And the whole point of it is to research why. So we know that there is a larger prevalence among active duty servicemen and service women with scleroderma, but the question is why? And the, the way to get to that answer is by supporting research funding. And the, some of the research that has been done is into the underlying mechanism of scleroderma. Uh, and what's important is understanding that greatly impacts the overall understanding of all fibrosis, which touches the entire body um, and has higher rates among individuals who serve in the military as well. We know that there are some environmental triggers that can lead to scleroderma. And we know that, again, servicemen and service women are at greater risk whether it's from burn pits or different areas where they're stationed across the world. And we know that there are a number of comorbid conditions that are associated with scleroderma uh, that also have a greater impact of those servicemen and service women. So for us in our engagement with Congress, we talk about the importance of, we know that on a limited basis that there is a connection, but we need that research support to understand why and how and to help us get a better sense of how to prevent some of these um, incidences of exposure or um, where some of our servicemen and service women can be exposed to something that can lead to scleroderma. Can you share our, our history with the PRMRP? Absolutely. So we've been very fortunate that as a community 
our advocates have been incredibly successful with engaging with their elected officials and with successfully competing for funds through the Department of Defense's peer reviewed medical research program. Scleroderma historically for many years has been listed as a condition eligible for study. And because of that, our researchers have successfully competed for over $10 million in scleroderma research projects. All of that has been critical to further our, our understanding of scleroderma. And none of this would be possible without you and your advocacy efforts. So I want to thank all of you who have throughout the years uh, advocated on behalf of the scleroderma community for inclusion in the PRMRP. We ask that you continue your advocacy. And it really is a tangible example of how advocacy does work. And by using your voice and educating members of Congress, there are tangible results that have greatly benefited and will continue to benefit our community. So what so are what, we asking for this year, Phil? Yep, uh, so what we're asking for is for senators to support the inclusion of scleroderma as a eligible condition in fiscal year 2023. And for your House member, we're asking uh, them to work with their Senate colleagues to support inclusion of scleroderma in the list of eligible conditions. The foundation for uh, every month so far this year, we've had quality meetings with key senators about the importance of including scleroderma. So we continue on a national level uh, of meeting with key decision makers and encouraging them and asking them to support this. What really drives all of that home is for members of the Senate to hear from their constituents and to have that uh, nationwide grassroots advocacy network, you know, uh, increase the number of senators who are reaching out to their colleagues to say, I was contacted about the importance of this. Please make sure that this is included. The more senators that ask for it, the greater the likelihood that we will be successful. And again, we just want to reiterate the importance of with scleroderma being on the eligibility uh, list, our researchers will be able to compete and secure that federal support to help the continued work that they're doing. There's a lot of good science and a good research that's being done, and we just want to ensure that uh, the research community continues to have that opportunity. Thank you, Phil. What are uh, some common questions you get asked by uh, whether it be a seasoned advocate or uh, very new? So some questions that I often hear are, does it make a difference and does my voice matter? Uh, the answer to both of those questions is absolutely yes. Uh, every contact you have with your elected official matters. Um, every time you use your voice to educate them, it does make a difference. As I mentioned before, I work here in DC every day on behalf of the foundation. I could walk into every single House office and every single Senate office. I have great relationships with, you know, many House members and many Senate members. And I could go in and say, you know, I really want to talk to you about the importance of including scleroderma on the PRMRP. Many of these folks will, you know, tell me, Phil, that makes sense. But the one question they will have is, how does this affect my state or how does this affect my district? Is there a constituent who can reach out to share why this is important? Um, so all of the work that you do is critical with all of the work that I'm doing. So we really are a partnership for uh, success where on the staff level, you know, I talk about the specific policies and, and specific ways to advance these things, but everybody will ask the same question of, does this affect anybody in my state or district? I wanna hear from people who I represent about why this is important. So that's where your voice uh, comes into that. And, you know, as I mentioned before, advocacy is 365 days a year. The appropriations process is not finalized until the president signs the bill. So it, there's plenty of opportunity for us to educate members and make this request. But also there is no limit on how much information an office can receive about better understanding the needs of the scleroderma community and finding how they can how they can be helpful. Great, thank you so much. So for further information about this training and the National Day of Action, contact Phil Goglis. His email and phone is listed there. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, for further information about resources available from the National Scleroderma Foundation, please feel free to contact me and my phone and email are listed. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your continued dedication and hard work to build our advocacy and raise awareness that will help our community to reach our goal, finding a cure for scleroderma. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much.